The hunt was now on for the second pyramid the old bard had described to the Lord King Henry, and it was soon discovered some distance to the south of the first. As the excavation continued, accompanied by the uncontrolled excitement of all present, the diggers soon uncovered a weighty stone slab lying between the two pyramids. When the soil was carefully removed from its surface, there was revealed a lead panel in the shape of a cross affixed to it, and on it an inscription. Water was poured on to cleanse it, and the words then appeared as clearly as the day they had been hammered in. I could make them out without assistance, and this is what they said. Here, in the Isle of Avalon, lies buried the renowned King Arthur, with Winevere, his second wife. When the panel and stone slab were both lifted, underneath was revealed a large section of old tree trunk, neatly cut and shaped, at least four feet in width and seven in length. Being in such proximity to the cloister, it was immediately apparent that the trunk lay in a north-south orientation, and I drew this to Abbot Henry's attention, informing him that this was common among the ancient pagan burials of the region, but unheard of as a Christian practice. The good abbot was a learned man, and he understood my anxiety immediately. His broad, dark blonde brows wrinkled, and his ever-perceptive green eyes moved quickly as he admitted he could not explain what lay before us. I confess that the sight of it did nothing to quell my deepening feelings of anxiety. At the request of Prior Gervais, Brother Walter, the abbey's carpenter, climbed down into the excavation trench and began examining the tree trunk. After inspecting it from every angle, he declared it to be hollow, constructed of a base and a lid, with the two joined together by wooden plugs and a seal of tar. He promptly ordered his novices to fetch certain tools from his workshop, and before long they returned bearing the requested implements. After working with the tools for some while on the join between the two halves, Brother Walter called for a number of brothers to attach stout ropes, and we all then heard the tomb's ancient seal cracking open as they pulled off the uppermost half of the arboreal sarcophagus. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return, the scriptures promise, and I had come to no graveyards, not least as abbess of my house of sisters at Shaftesbury. My responsibilities had brought me the knowledge that after a body has been several decades in the ground awaiting the resurrection, only the bones remain, and thereafter providence turns some bones to dust in several years, while others may take centuries to crumble to nothingness. In cold, damp climes, like the west of England, bones do not remain in the earth for long, but are soon pulverised. I was therefore expecting the hollow within the tree tomb to contain mounds of royal dust, with perhaps some small remnant of one or two of the more substantial limbs, like a hip or thigh bone. Beyond the excitement of the mortal remains, I was, however, principally hoping that maybe the regal couple had been laid to rest with some ancient jewels, coins, weapons, instruments, or other objects of interest. Instead, when the upper portion of the sarcophagus was moved away, the vision that greeted us was more hellish than anything I have perceived when afflicted by fever in the blackness of the night. I closed my eyes in revulsion at the sight, and instinctively crossed myself three times, shuddering to the depths of my being. The royal couple were supine, laid out side by side. He was physically imposing, broad and easily a head taller than most men. She also was tall, with a noticeably slender frame. But the cause of the audible gasps of horror among the onlookers, some of whom had recoiled at the abomination, was that where the intervening centuries should have taken away all clothes and flesh, they had done so only in part. The annals are filled with the holiest of saints, like Cuthbert, Athelthrith and Alphia, whose bodies were integrally preserved by the spirit, uncorrupted after death. But what I beheld in the cold earth at Glastonbury was not the repose of the blessed. Rather, it was an unutterable blasphemy and a sin against the spirit. The royal couple's mortal remains appeared hideously half-dead. Clumps of rancid flesh, partial organs and flaps of skin hung onto sections of their skeletons, 
while in other areas slimy browned bones were fully exposed. Their mouths still held several teeth, and both scalps sprouted tufts and hanks of rotted hair. The king's was a dirty acorn colour, as were the patchy remnants of beard protruding off his jaw, while on the queen the mangy tresses clinging to sections of scalp were of an anemic red. Their clothes too, which the graves should have swallowed, clung in decomposing tatters about them. He also bore sections of corroded chainmail, in areas stuck to bone where there was no muscle or sinew to support it. Similarly, rags of dull, mouldy blue lapped around her, with occasional hints of dulled gold thread just visible in the gathering twilight. The pair of putrid cadavers was an abomination not of this world, or the next. It was neither life nor death, purgatory nor hell, but some other hideous state of which the scriptures do not speak. Some of the onlookers averted their eyes and groaned in revulsion. I heard a voice intoning the words of the psalmist, For though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and staff comfort me. Barely had this horror registered with the crowd, than another, even greater, manifested itself. I still shudder as I recollect it, and struggle to find the words to capture the sheer terror that seized all present. Never! had the depredations of the Danish heathens on our holy places, or the assaults of the Saracens on the land where his feet trod, caused blood to turn cold so instantly, for the feculent remnants of one of the eye orbs in the hideous half-thing that once had been Guinevere slowly rolled towards the onlookers. My heart stopped beating for what seemed an age. Some screamed and fled, but I found myself unable to tear my gaze from that hideous jelly. However, the paralysis passed when I eventually appreciated that the foul eye was again still, and I reasoned that it must merely have been resettling after being disturbed by the removal of the tree tomb's lid. The ungodly horror of the rotting cadavers still froze the air, and Abbot Henry swiftly approached the graveside to recite a prayer of blessing over the foul remains. Ashen-faced, and with his leonine features set in grim solemnity, he commanded that the planned ceremony be commenced, and so a two-person litter that had been dressed with sumptuous cushions and regal blue damask was brought forward. The bodies were carefully lifted and laid onto it, and a solemn procession to the abbey church began. This cortege was led by a crucifer holding aloft a large ceremonial crucifix. Four lucifers with tall white candles at each corner of the litter, and thurifers at the front and back, wreathing the beer in fumes of sweet frankincense and spices. All followed, singing the confitable in solemn unison, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, with all my heart. All the kings of the earth will give you thanks. The procession passed the cloisters, then moved down the south side of the great abbey church towards the grand west entrance. As the litter was on the verge of entering the cool shade of the temple, I found myself unexpectedly praying that some divine force would prevent the progress of that hellish procession. But no heavenly intervention came. The monks were now singing the 43rd psalm, I will enter unto the altar of the Lord, and the litter passed through the tall arched doorway into the pristine new lady chapel, and then on into the holy temple's long nave. When it was my turn to enter the great doorway, I could see that up ahead the litter had already reached a point under the ravaged stone root screen with its large effigies of Christ flanked by Saints Peter and Paul looking down on the calm scene below. The procession moved on and the royal couple were soon at the high altar where they were laid onto an ornamental catafalque set out in readiness to receive their earthly remains. The Lucifers stationed themselves at the four sides of the royal display, pointing outwards to the cardinal points of the compass, and we all filed solemnly around the bodies, praying for the repose of their eternal souls. As I gazed upon the hideous countenances, the feeling of dread that had been with me since the previous evening now crystallised into a certainty that, in unearthing these monstrosities, we had brought something beyond God's law into his abbey.